I'm going to start out with a story uh, this morning. A dear brother uh, from Detroit once told me about a serious trial that he had uh, one day when he was cutting the grass. He was distracted uh, by uh, somebody uh, nearby, and he was cutting his grass and moved the, uh, the lawnmower too close to, uh, to a bush, and it got caught. And uh, upon looking at this distraction, uh, he wasn't thinking and just by instinct reached down to uh, free up his lawnmower. And you can guess uh, what might have happened. When he looked at his hand, he was missing three fingers. And uh, his first thought in shock looking at his finger was, why me? Why me? And... Uh, that's a pretty hard trial to lose three fingers, I imagine. Have you ever found yourself asking in any trial that you've had, why me? Or perhaps, why do I have such hard trials? The way I look at it, everybody in this life has perhaps three choices on trials. If you're a Christian, you can either have trials for correction or development, or if in the world, you just have random experiences. People in the world have random trials, don't they? But be assured, they all have hardships in one way or the other, some more, some less. However, I believe the difference with us as new creatures is that perhaps most of our trials are basically arranged, arranged trials, since the very hairs of our head are numbered. So I believe that all these trials are tailor-made for us, for a special place in the body of Christ. Maybe you would basically agree with that. Many, if not most of these trials are part of our drinking the cup, which our Father has poured for us. Most of these trials, if rightly exercised, are to earn our kingdom credentials. Some of us have very difficult financial trials. Some have trials of debilitating physical afflictions. Some emotional and psychological trials. Trials with your children. Some hidden marital trials. Trials at work. Trials with a body that's aging and leaving you both mentally and physically challenged at times. We sometimes have trials with our neighbors and even trials with our brethren from time to time. Sometimes we have trials of persecution for what we believe, and sometimes trials with people misunderstanding and misjudging us. Sometimes these trials can leave us rather depressed and discouraged. Sometimes, sometimes, they can leave us scratching our head in perplexity. And sometimes they can leave us looking up and asking to understand, what is the lesson? What is the lesson? And asking for a stronger back to bear the load or weight of the trial. First Peter 4.12, you're all familiar with, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing has happened unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. So don't think it strange and try to rejoice. Because you know that that trial has value, has a purpose. Perhaps God's tailor-made this experience for you and for me. Do these trials leave you rejoicing in the spirit? Brother, and like Brother Edmund Jesuit said one time, and I, I really miss Brother, uh, Brother Ed. He was a very precious help to me. He said, you know... We're all like tea bags, not worth much until you put us into some hot water. 
and how true, how true that seems. You know, in the battlefield of life, we have the question of what is the victory that overcometh? What is the victory that overcometh? Right. Even your faith. Faith is like a Christian's burial plot for worry. Trust just keeps shoveling more and more dirt over worry. Confidence in the Lord is the primary goal in the school of Christ. God will keep him in perfect peace if what? Your good Bible students. If your mind is stayed on him. And the exceeding great and precious promises that God has given you and I, that's the key. Staying on these promises. That'll be your vehicle to carry you to the divine nature. 1 Peter 1, verse 4. I think that is what stayed on him is mostly talking about. All things eventually do work together for good, don't they? Not necessarily for the flesh, because it should be dead anyway but rather work out together for the good as growth for the new creature in Christ. Scriptural knowledge, spiritual perception, and confident faith, confident faith, trust, trust is what drives your attitude to navigate these invaluable life lessons, to steer your way to your heavenly home. Have you been having trials that almost seem to consume you at times, trials that sap your mental and emotional and physical energy, and sometimes make you even want to check out of this present life and go to your heavenly home. You may feel that way, but you know you can't because you gave God your life, right? It's his now. These trials, these trials are not easy. But God never said it was going to be easy, did he? Was it easy for Jesus, for Paul, for Peter, James, or John? God never said it was going to be easy. Now, brother, we're not masochists, but do you appreciate your trials as new creatures? And in some way, are they a blessing to you and to me? Do you have a stronger back than you used to, spiritually speaking, to endure hardness as a good soldier who is fighting the good fight? Are we getting to where we can say that we can count it joy, all joy, when we experience these trials? Hebrews 12, 11. Now, no chastening or disciplining for the present seemeth joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, afterward, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. The question really is, are we being properly exercised by our trials? Are we learning? Are we learning compassion for humanity through these trials? These trials, dear friends, these trials are your and my credentials for future service as the kingdom priests in that body of 144,000, to tell the world, you know, you understand the struggle. Can you drink of this cup? Can I? Matthew 10, 35 to 45. So what actually is a trial? Well, we understand that a trial is simply a test. When Abraham tested, or what we should say was Abraham tested, when he waited 25 long years to finally receive the promise God had given him. Sometimes waiting can be a difficult trial, can it? For example, Hannah and Jacob's waiting in the Old Testament. 
To develop our waiting skills is very important. We have a harder and harder time waiting in this fast-paced, fast-serve lifestyle that we lead, don't we? To develop these waiting skills with Amazon and FedEx and fast food and restaurants almost having conditioned us for impatience. Our computers don't respond quickly. And perhaps we start having conniptions because it's taken over 10 seconds to respond. What's wrong? <laughs> Do you have problems with patience? You don't have to raise your hand. Guess what? There's an equation in the scriptures of James 1, verses 2 and 3. Take a look at it. Turn your Bibles and look it up. It basically says, your faith in trials where you're properly trained produces patience. Well, if that's what you want, more patience, guess what you're going to get? That's the means or the vehicle to help you produce, in part, this element or fruitage of patience. James is saying that if we are learning from our arranged trials in faith, the product or outcome will be the fruit of patience. Sometimes these tests or trials are to check or improve our strengths and weaknesses under varying conditions. So this is our point. Trials are necessary, sometimes fiery trials, to check our strengths and weaknesses and stretch our faith and grow our kingdom credentials in the fruits of the Spirit and in compassion for humanity's plight from sin. There are also opportunities, opportunities to demonstrate our faithfulness and loyalty. Thank you, Brother David, for that. Brother David gave a nice talk on this some years ago. God wants to grow and test our faith superstructure in the soil of trials and blessings. Do not many of us pray, Lord, increase our faith? Well, is it an egg or is it a serpent, a scorpion? Luke 11, verse 9. It's a matter of spiritual perception. How can our faith increase without trials of challenging experiences? And God desires to see how well we are learning our scriptural lessons. So we often check our performance level under various trial conditions. Sound reasonable? Abraham, Abraham had a, a high performance level. Unlike many of us who are weaker in our faith, we never read where Abraham questioned God, right? Where he said, why me? Why me? Not once did he do that. I don't remember Abraham questioning God even when it came about that God wanted him to sacrifice his son. How about complaining? Do we find Abraham ever complaining? How about Noah or Daniel? Does God like us to complain? I'm embarrassed to admit it, but I catch myself complaining sometimes. I sometimes do it. Perhaps you do too, right? I believe most all do it from time to time, don't we? Are we complaining about what God pours into our cup? We complain because we think God turned the heat up too high on our fiery trial experience. Are we complaining about that? That actually the divine tailor made for us? That divine providence worked out for us? Are we complaining about that? I complained because I had no shoes until I met a man who had no feet. But our intention is, I will neither murmur nor complain about what the Lord's providence may permit. For what? For faith, there it is. For faith can what? How firmly? Firmly trust him, come what may. But it's our intention. Abraham was a very great model of faith. Trials of our faith may be for us to realize our own level of spiritual attainment or skill attainment, as much as it might be for God to assess our growth, to see if we are rooted and grounded in righteousness and in love. In fact, there may be trials that are only for our appreciation of our own recognition of the need that we have, right? 
Philippians 3.15. Philippians 3.15. Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. And take note, if anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. The Apostle Peter, you recall, felt his own estimation of things, that there was no way he would ever deny knowing our Lord, right? However, the trial that God allowed for him, the trial that God tailored for him, made him realize a weakness that apparently he didn't realize he had, that he was weak in his own strength, his own abilities, his own self-confidence. And that he needed more and more faith-developing experiences in his life. The outcome? Humility. Humility that helped him stay on course for the rest of his onward journey. So humbled that tradition says he didn't even feel worthy to be crucified like our Lord. So Peter asked to be hung upside down. At least that's what tradition says. The feeling of unworthiness, perhaps a humbled conscience of something that happened in the past. So too with us, dear brethren. It is God's strength. It is God's strength that is made perfect in our weakness. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9. Kingdom credentials. For example, we may think at age 19 or 20 that we had already attained a great deal of patience. I know I did. Then we had children. As a result, we could see how very little patience we actually had and how much more we needed, right? The effect, perhaps over the next 18 years or so, might be to take us continually to the throne of grace and seek the Lord's strength to help us develop more patience. So we didn't say or do things that we'd feel badly about or ashamed of later on in life. But if we did, we learn humility. Kingdom credentials. Therefore, trials could have the effect of demonstrating some Adamic weakness we still retain within our soul which often sends us running more and more frequently to the heavenly throne of grace for the much needed strength of that deficit area of character. But it's a humbling process, isn't it? And it should teach us a great deal, a great deal of compassion with others. And this is the main point. Many trials serve to increase our dependency, our dependency on the Lord and his strength. Too many novice Christians, and sometimes even slowly developing Christians, are still self-reliant, self-conceited, self-sufficient. Pride is the Goliath of the flesh that needs to be slain permanently before graduation of the new creature. Brother Ken Rawson used to say, the new creature only grows some of you know this, at what? At the expense of the flesh, right? At the expense of the old. The success of our race course depends in part on the fuel of humility that runs the engine of our sanctified hearts. Humility will get you more mileage on your mental tank of experiences. Trials can produce or cultivate humble dependency. And our humble dependency on the Lord should drive us more and more to feed on the spiritual resources of prayer and study. Speaking of study, please read The Ministry of Sorrow, if you haven't read it recently or at all. The Ministry of Sorrow. It's a good follow-up reprint to this discourse. Reprint 5802, 5802. Another point to our trials is this. We all sin don't we? Whoever says otherwise makes God a liar. The scriptures say so. 1 John 1.10. Many, but not all of our sins are partially willful. In other words, there's a measure of willfulness 
hopefully very small in many of our lifetime sins. Now, the way I understand it, we are covered by the efficacious blood of Christ for all Adamic sins, unintentional sins. But to whatever percentage there is a measure of light or knowledge or a measure of willfulness involved, there is nothing to cover that partially willful or knowledgeable part of the sin. The virtue of Christ's blood only covers unpremeditated sins or the portion of sin without knowledge or unpremeditated Adamic weakness. Basically, unintentional sins are Adamic sin, from my understanding, what the Bible calls trespasses. They are all covered by asking for forgiveness. 1 John 1.9. 1 John 1.9. What merciful provisions, dear brother, and God has made for our condition. But some of our trials are for correction, expiated sins, expiated sins. These are stripes necessary for our discipline and education. Just as a child will sometimes be given a spanking or privileges taken away. The great prophet Moses was kind of spanked, in my opinion, when the privilege of going to Canaan was taken away from him. Remember, Moses failed God's direction on the rock and then demonstrated pride. He said, must we bring you water out of this rock? Remember that? But he was still a great man who God loved. Sometimes we, like Moses and even King David, who committed some very grievous sins, must be divinely spanked or certain privileges withheld in the process of being forgiven. Yeah. Do we want these trials of correction? Well, we should avoid causing them at all costs, but if we deserve them, we need them to help us make inward corrections of self-control and better judgment. Hebrews 12, verses 5 to 11. But always remember that forgiveness, I believe, is always within reach to the humble and contrite heart through repentance and the precious, efficacious blood of Christ Jesus. Psalms 51, verses 9 to 17. 51, 9 to 17. And the manna for January 28. Brethren, it's all about choices. It's all about choices. Spiritually educated, divine-driven choices. And choices have consequences. Choices have consequences. Even poor choices can sometimes have good choices if we have the contrition of heart and humility needed on this pilgrim journey. Romans 8, 28 and 2 Corinthians 7, 10 to 11. Therefore, some trials can be for correction for poor choices. These trials hopefully teach us to make better choices the next time around. A warrior of the fallen flesh determined to make better and better, cho better and better choices, focused on character improvement, may correct himself in some cases where he realizes that he's made a bad choice with partially, perhaps, partial wolf willfulness in it. Turn with me, if you will, to 1 Corinthians 11, 31. 1 Corinthians 11, 31. Well, listen now. For if, if we should judge ourselves, notice that, if we should judge ourselves, we should not be judged. God sometimes gives us a choice, I believe. God basically says, do you want to correct or appropriately discipline yourself, or do you want me to correct you? Let us learn how to properly discipline ourselves so that the Lord may not have to. Read the manna for January 26, January 26 for suggestions. Again, regarding our trial, is it a fish or is it a serpent? An eel is a fish, isn't it? But it looks like a serpent, doesn't it? Spiritual perception decides. The little flock looks at their trials like a nutritional opportunity 
There's that word opportunity again. Like a nutritional opportunity, but the great company perceives it to be a serpent. This brings us back to our point we made earlier. Trials increase our sensitivity, our compassion to not only the struggles the world is having now, but the struggles people will have in the kingdom with their flesh as they walk up the highway of holiness. We're being prepared for the ministry of reconciliation. We're gaining our kingdom credentials. Trials can painstakingly develop our compassion for the human struggle. 2 Corinthians 5, verses 18 to 21. The compassion of the process of character transformation. In some ways, we're playing kingdom right now, aren't we? In the gospel age, we are reckonly justified by what? Again, by faith, right? Faith in the virtuous blood of Jesus. But the world of mankind will have to be actually justified in the mediation by works. That's a long, hard process, isn't it? Revelation 20, verse 12. They have to become actually perfect as an end product. That's not easy to do. The church class is the means to that end. Let me repeat that. The church class is the means to that end. We are not necessarily the end product here, are we? So the means has to be trained and disciplined to earn its kingdom credentials for the privilege, the privilege of rehabilitating and compassionately bringing mankind to that end goal. Make sense? Final inspection by Jehovah. 1 Corinthians 15, 24 and Revelation 20, verses 7 to 13. Perhaps I told you this before, but I looked on the internet one time and I found a number of Larry McClellans. That's kind of scary. <laughs> There's going to be another Larry McClellan some somewhere in the kingdom, riddled with the stain of weaknesses and deficiencies resulting from the Adamic fall. He's going to have some selfishness and pride to get rid of. He's going to have to Learn how to forgive and truly love his enemies. Give the benefit of the doubt to others and practice a lot of self-control. He's going to find it a struggle developing patience and humility. A struggle to learn how to live by justice, righteousness, and the golden rule. How to be more thoughtful of others than he is himself. Learn to trust God completely and live in complete obedience to the kingdom laws that God has given. God wants us to learn it ourselves, dear brethren, before we teach it to others. He wants us to experience the struggle of change. He's going to feel a lot of frustrations, this Larry McClellan in the kingdom, trying to get rid of all that sinful atomitis, these human weaknesses, these sinful propensities, and more. Sometimes it feels a little overwhelming, the changes that need to be made. Do you ever feel that way? The world will someday have a great physician, a composite Christ physician of 144,000 that truly, truly understand. Trials and tests on the Larry McClellan of the Gospel Age, the one speaking to you right now, who is also realizing as a result of those trials that he is still struggling, like an emerging butterfly trying to wiggle free from the Adamic stains of weaknesses and deficiencies, the frustrations of impatience with the children he tutors at school, the frustration of trying to love and truly forgive people who have hurt him in his life, Sometimes in the family or even amongst the brethren, those less perhaps less mature in the spirit. That Larry McClellan has become more sensitive to the process of getting free of Adamitis, the sinful propensities of our fallen flesh. That Larry McClellan is a work in progress. And the faithful will be very sympathetic in this ministry of reconciliation when hopefully he works with the millions who will need to know 
that he understands the struggle of transformational change. He's walked in their shoes. He knows how they feel. He understands the struggle and frustration of character transformation. It's not easy to change, is it? But change we must. And nothing changes unless something changes. Find the cause to change the effect. Trials can sometimes surface causes, problematic areas in our character. Then we can target intervention to better bring forth a more desirable effect. The Apostle Paul brings out three of those desirable goals of our instruction to Timothy in 1 Timothy 1, verse 5. But the goal of our instruction, it says there, is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. 1 Timothy 1, verse 5. You recall the words of the hymn, when I in thy likeness, O Lord, may awake and shine a pure image of thee. Then, then I shall be satisfied when I can break the fetters of flesh and be free. The world will need the encouragements of a former freedom fighter of the flesh, John 8, 36 a veteran from the battlefield of life and the human struggle with fighting sin. Fetters are like ankle chains that don't let you walk after the spirit the way your heart really desires. They shorten your stride. Only those who learn how to really walk the talk will be able to teach others how to change, teach others how to be transformed. As my mom, Hazel McClellan, used to teach me, we are formed in Adam, informed by God's holy word, conformed to the image of Christ, and transformed. How? Transformed by the renewing of our minds. Changed. Romans 8, 29 to 31. But it can be a painstaking process, can it? People don't like change. We don't like change. I guess that's why it's called a little flock. <laughs> People resist change, especially if it threatens enjoyment or attempts to bring on cognitive dissonance in preconceived notions. People will have to be mentally conformed and transformed in the kingdom, similar to the process that we are experiencing, brother. Although unlike us, then they'll be fighting just two enemies the flesh, and initially the world, initially. The old adversary is going to be locked up, isn't he? Until the end of the millennium. As the world gradually changes, humanity will only have one enemy until the end. That's a nice kingdom advantage for them. They should make good progress. Another point to the purpose of our trials is this. Trials develop holiness. Trials develop holiness. You and I will not see the Lord without developing holiness. Hebrews 12, 14 says that. Many tests the Lord gives us are for the purpose of what? Sanctification, of galvanizing us, setting us apart from the world more and more in a life of holiness. Holy thinking, sanctified thinking, our cross-brain trials at work or in the neighborhood where we hold a high standard of morality, or we speak the real truth of God's plan, and sometimes we're persecuted as a result. This sets us apart further and further from the friendship of the world, riddled with sin and unholiness. Trials can polarize us more and more into the sanctified mindset of Jesus Christ, our righteous Redeemer, where we can repel the worldly thoughts, the worldly attitudes, and the worldly desires in the environment of sin that surrounds us. Many unholy thoughts creep into our minds through the television, right? In worldly conversation, YouTube, and more. It's an environmental 
osmosis. By choosing a righteous path, a narrow way, a holy way of thinking, we more and more fortify our convictions of developing a holy lifestyle and disposition and separate ourselves more and more from the world of carnality. As you know, oil and water don't mix very well, do they? And neither do the hopes, aims, and ambitions, the attitudes and thinking and lifestyle of a Christian with others in the world who are going in another direction. I believe primarily driven by the marketing media of a very sensual world. Love not the world, neither the things, the things that are in the world. It's John, I think, 1 John 2, 15 and 16 and 17. If any man love the world, what? The love of the Father is not in him. Can't do it. You can't walk both streets. As old Everett Murray used to say from Indiana, some of you still remember him. He used to say, the great company has one hand on heaven and one hand on earth. So that's just where God puts him, going back and forth between heaven and earth. I think my dear friend, Ron Chastain, gave a talk one time called, and it was a good title, How to Get Into the Great Company Without Really Trying. Look it up. And you might want to read volume six, page 469, paragraph one. You know, brethren, it's kind of like the law of gravity. I could take this pin I'm holding, right, and drop it over and over. And the same thing will happen over and over, right? You can all do it. You don't have to do it now. Gravity is what? It's a fixed principle. It's fixed. God wants to see our characters more and more fixed. So he can trust us someday with the divine nature. Are you and I ready yet? I believe being spiritually fixed in Christ's likeness is the same as perhaps what the Bible calls Jesus being justified in the spirit. Notice the difference. We're all justified in the flesh, right? Made right by the blood of Christ, the imputed merit of Christ. Jesus didn't need that, did he? He was already perfect, but he was justified in the spirit. Look it up, what it means. I think it's 59, 59, 60. Probably 59, 60 at the top left, if you want to take a look at it. So, are we ready? Right? He was proven perfect as a new creature, fixed in righteousness, love, and loyalty to his heavenly father. Our trials are opportunities, again, to test and develop us, aren't they? Are we there yet? The promises, the blessings, and even the trials can transport us if we learn just how God wants us to travel. But we need our spiritual credentials, authorized by the blood of Christ. I believe it's entirely possible for us to perfect our intentions if we follow the program. But intentions must have fruition. God wants to see fruits. That's the way we glorify him. Look it up, John 15, 8. If you truly wish to glorify God, bear fruits of the Spirit. That's the way you're going to glorify God. So I believe the Lord arranges trials and tests in our life's experiences to cultivate our faith and fix our righteousness, his righteousness rather, and his loving principles within us. Then test us over and over like dropping this pin to see if we will gravitate to make the same righteous and loving choices based on his righteous and loving principles. Do we consistently make righteous and loving choices given a series of similar situations? Time will tell. Consequently, and this is the point, trials develop and prove the fixity of our love of righteousness and hatred of sin. Hebrews 1, verse 9, on the path of earning our spiritual reward, our spiritual or kingdom credentials. How can we truly teach 
something to others that we haven't really made an effort to learn ourselves, right? Knowledge, knowledge drives choices and choices drive consequences. And the consequences we want is to be like our master, do the will of God and be faithful even unto death, to be faithful and obedient and gain the forever favor of Jehovah God, our father. And so we as Christ followers are tested on our familiarity and obedience to God's scriptural direction. Thereby, we can sling a stone of God's power to dismantle Satan's temptations, part of our manna today. Resist the adversary and what? He'll flee from you, right? Tell him firmly and with no wavering, with no wavering, stand behind me, Satan. Let him get frustrated. Let him get frustrated with our spiritual stubbornness to not listen to him. James 1.12. Then there are trials of compassion. I'm sorry. Trials of correction, rather. Trials of, uh, trials of comparison. That's what I'm trying to say. Trials of comparison. Sometimes we look around and we compare others to our brethren. We compare them and saying, why does it seem like we struggle so much with physical illnesses and poor health and other brother near our own age seem to be the pictures of perfect human health? Or why do we seem to struggle all the time with financial issues, trying to make ends meet, and other brethren seem so well off and never appear to have a worry in the world about their finances? They have money for about anything they want to do. Or perhaps, why do I have such social anxieties and cannot interact and dialogue like others do? Why do I have such trials with my adult children, making so many poor choices in their lives and bringing so much sorrow to themselves as well as to us? And on top of that, I have never seen my children and their families because they live so far away. Well, there are brethren who have grown children that are very successful, happy, and trying to learn more about God and live close by where they can see them all the time in their family gatherings. Trial by comparison. Remember the poem about the, ver the various crosses? You all remember that, right? In Poems of Don, where the Christian discovered that the other crosses the other Christians carried were not as attractive when they saw the reality of the comparative difficulty that they actually had. A lot is perception, isn't it? The cross that the Christian picked out in the end was the very best one for him, wasn't it? And that's why God had matched up that cross appropriately for that individual it was the one he had god knew what he was doing the cross that god picks out becomes the bridge that we cross over to get to our heavenly canaan hebrews 13 5 turn with me to john 21 18 to 22 john 21 18 to 22 Recall the time when Peter was basically told how he was going to die by Jesus. Remember that? Then Peter asked, what was going to happen to John? Recall what Jesus said to him? What is that to thee? Pretty close. I understand that Jesus was basically saying, that is not your affair, Peter, or really none of your business. Peter. We should not be concerned about comparing our trials. This might be what Jesus was saying. Or what the Lord's providence and wisdom meets out for you or me. He knows what's best for us, doesn't he? Recall the words of Jesus when he said, The cup which my father pours, shall I not drink it? God himself pours that cup for me and for you, brother. Brother, we know not what is best for our individual needs our skills and compassion for our development in the school of Christ, nor do we know what special purpose that God is designing for us in these experiences, that we may someday truly know no disappointment. We have to be submerged into his will, completely submerged, 
For when, it, when we are completely submerged in the Lord's will, when we reach that point, then we can know no disappointment, including a trial of comparing our trials with other brethren. Listen to an excellent talk, uh, I don't mean to embarrass him, by Brother Rick Cunningham on that, called What Is That to Thee? It's a really good one. You receive a huge blessing if you do. I know I did. Trial by comparison. Thank you, Brother Rick. I know our time is closing on here. As has been stated before, trials are to train us. Train us for the priesthood of the mediatorial kingdom. We're in training to be a royal priesthood, aren't we? A Melchizedek priesthood, comprised of 144,000 divine beings. Revelation 20, verse 4 to 6. Divine beings that God has to be able to completely trust with a divine nature. So high in office and position demands, demands a rigorous testing program to make certain no mistakes are made that cannot ever be corrected or reversed. Divine nature means that you're death proof. Tell me, what kinds of tests would you give to someone who you would never be able to destroy subsequent to their? resurrection to the divine nature would they be harder than the ones that god has given you right now in your life think it not strange think it not strange now that we've taken a look at a few of the reasons for our trials let's take a look at our perception of our trials our perception of them we mentioned it before our attitude about our trials attitude is a struggle, but often drives our choices as to whether or not we're going to be faithful through our trial experiences. Hopefully, the foregoing has helped. So this is our question. How do we perceive our trials? Just how do we look at them? What is one of the main goals if we are walking after the Spirit? Is it not to obtain more of His Holy Spirit? Doesn't God greatly desire us to ask for more of the Spirit? Luke 11. But guess what the exchange is for the procurement of such valuable infusion of God's spirit? The greater the trials faithfully endured, the greater the blessings. But attitude can make or break you in this process. Our goal is to have an attitude of gratitude, to be grateful for whatever the Lord's providence may permit. Reflect on the words of Jesus in Luke 11, verses 9 to 11, and see if you don't find two different attitudes presented in Jesus' remarks, one of the little flock and one of the great company regarding the perception of their trials. Probably one of the best talks I ever heard. I, and again, I don't mean to embarrass him, but Brother Wes Kramer gave a lovely talk on this. Is it an egg or is it a serpent, I believe, or a scorpion? Brother Wes will break that down more for you if you listen to that talk. Dear brethren, as regards our trials, I'm reminded once again of what dear brother Ed Jesuit said many years ago. Let us never strive to put a question mark where God has placed a period. Let us all strive to be fully submerged into God's will to the best of our abilities, fully trusting, believing in God's wisdom for our trials and all of God's exceeding great and precious promises for us, fully claiming them, in the name of Jesus, and in the words of the late Sister, Sor uh, Sister Cora Sunbaum, many years ago, your trials are worth millions, millions, don't waste any of them. Beloved in Christ, and in closing, we have teaching credentials to teach children, don't we? Electrical licenses to wire homes and buildings, and physical credentials, like for physicians to help heal diseases you are working on your you are working on your physician's credentials the great physician to surgically operate on and heal humanity from all the mental and physical diseases caused by sin and give people eventually a new heart jeremiah 31 33 never forget your friends that you are a people for a purpose. Again, as Brother Rick used to say, your purpose is to lift up and bless all the families of the earth and the kingdom. 
People who were riddled with sin, overcome with guilt, still blaming God for their tragic trials they experienced, humbled by their unrighteous acts of violence, jealousy, and hate. People who will be instructed that they must walk up the highway of holiness, be transformed from their former lust and bad habits of speech, changed from their evil speaking, their pride, and their sinful lust that led them into moral decay. People that had prejudices against others, like some of us had, who struggled with mental illness, oppositional dysfunction disorder, social anxiety, Asperger's, or borderline personality disorder. People that had brain tumors and cancer and drug addictions and struggled with alcoholism. People that lost their babies in childbirth and people who suffered the ravages, the ravages of painful divorces and lost their jobs, their incomes, and their homes, like some of us. People who lost loved ones in horrific wars and even some who committed suicide and struggled why they were raped or murdered or so brutally and unjustly treated, like some of us. Brethren, your trials are your kingdom credentials to help humanity to open up their minds to receive the assistance that you can offer them because they know that you felt their pain because they know that you were in their shoes. Never underestimate the value of your trials, dear ones, for the ultimate blessing of all the families of the earth. Your trials are worth millions. Don't waste any of them. Our beloved master said, take my yoke upon you, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Let us just faithfully learn the lessons and pray that our eyes might be opened to the lessons learned. Fight the good fight of faith. Internalize the truth in Christ's likeness. And with zeal and resolute Christian purpose, let us all work very hard to earn our kingdom credentials. Amen.